I'm okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Yeah. It's a cold morning in uh, Las Vegas, huh? I'm expecting to see snow at any minute. All right? Yeah, I think we saw some snow a little earlier on a mountain around here a week or so ago, huh? That kind of melted off, but, uh, but it was sure, sure brisk this morning. Uh, I was wondering if I was going to have to get a toe out of the snowbank. Uh, <laughs> I lived in Chicago years ago, so I know how that goes. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, I remember I pushed, uh, I helped a guy get out of his parking spot and pushed on him and got him going. And I said, okay, it's your turn. Can you help me get out of my spot? Oh, no, I'm too old for that. And he drove off. So. <laughs> <laughs> That was when I was much, much younger. Uh, yeah. I threw snowballs at him on the way down the street. <laughs> anyway, good morning again. And so my uh, number one son here is with me today, Robert Jr. And so uh, my granddaughter's around someplace, but I think she's taking care of her, uh, my great granddaughters. So uh, maybe her and her husband will come in and join us. I don't know. Anyway, we're at we're in, in the study of the book of Daniel, and uh, the title of it is the overall title of it anyway is the wise shall understand, and this is the study of Daniel lesson nineteen. And let's bow our hearts in prayer, Father. We uh, Come before you, Lord. Uh, We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful blessing and mercy. We thank you, Lord, for the for the wonderful uh, day that is set before us, Lord. It looks like it's going to be a beautiful day, although a bit cold in the morning. Uh, We're not complaining, though. Uh, uh, Your seasons are there for us. We thank you, Lord, for all of that, and we ask your blessing on this class here assembled uh, this morning. And we just praise and glorify you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. So we're going to do the Why Shall Understand, the study of Daniel, Lesson 19, and the subtitle of it is The Little Horn. So we'll get into uh, more of that, and uh, we're going to be looking at the beasts of Daniel and Revelation today in some detail, and uh, we'll finish up in Daniel chapter 7 with verses 25 through 28. Uh, and as we go through this, you might want to grab your Bibles and uh, turn over to Revelation uh, chapter 17. Uh, I think it might be helpful if you keep uh, those verses open through much of this lesson uh, so that you might want to go back and refer to some of the verses that we're going to talk about. Okay? Okay. So Revelation 17, and beginning in verse 1, it's a woman rides the beast. Revelation 17, verse 1, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And verse 3, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And verse 4, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore, 
didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carried her, which has a seven heads or governments. Remember, we talked about heads, uh, governments, kingdoms, or empires, and uh, ten horns is kings. Okay, so that's, that's what those mean. So was there a question? Okay. And verse 10, And there were seven kings, uh, kingdoms or empires. Five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short, short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. Now this sounds very complicated. Uh, it is, but yet it is not complicated when you understand the history of what's going on here in these verses. So we're going to try to break it down for you so you can kind of understand what all this means. So the woman represents false religion with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So you have a woman and you have kings uh, that have committed fornication with her. In other words, they've partaken of her false religion over the centuries. Now this is what this is representing here. Because remember, we talked about the beast representing all different kingdoms. And uh, so she sits on seven empires or governments. And John Walvoord, who was a, uh, a great... Uh, uh, prophecy uh, uh, commentator. Uh, he's no longer with us. He, he's went to uh, be with his Lord. Uh, he believes that the woman is best interpreted as apostate Christianity in the end times working together with the political systems. I might add to that, I believe it is that and more. I believe it represents apostate Christianity working together with uh, political systems and working together with the new age and working together with Islam in something called interfaithism that we see emerging in these days, in these times. And I believe that many, many, many uh, of the more well-known um, evangelists and, and uh, uh, spiritual leaders that we, we see on the scene have fallen into this ecumenical trap and are participating in this oneness type of thing with interfaithism. So it'll be a merger. I believe it'll be a merger. Uh, there'll be a merger of the world religions. We get then to a one world religion. Now notice how John Phillips and Jerry Vines describes the Antichrist as a unifying influence. So this is how they put it in their commentary on the book. They say, wickedness will get worse and worse. Do we see that today? Wickedness is getting worse and worse. And, 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 the, and the, they go on, as the man of sin, the promotion of sin will be his chief aim. So he's going to promote sin. Is sin promoted today? Is it promoted today? From your televisions and even your politicians promote sin. And your Supreme Court promotes sin. Yes? Amen. In other words, it, it's, it's depriving you. Blasphemy is going on today, and it's almost like a common word, right, in, in this society. So, he will gratify lust and glorify sin. Is that going on today? He will appear as the Messiah of the Jews, the Mahdi of the Muslims, 
the Krishna of the Hindus. He will be the ideal of the humanists, the Christ of apostate Christendom, the mantra of the Eastern mystics, a war-weary, famine-ravished, disease-ridden, plague-infected, panic-stricken world will hail him till the indignation or abomination of desolation found in Matthew 24, 15 be accomplished. That's where we're headed. In view of this, could it be that the final religion will merge New Age beliefs, the apostasy of liberal Protestant and Catholic churches, and Islam together in a oneness of spirit and nature? I believe that's exactly what's happening. And uh, if you want, some, I think most of you have already gotten this newsletter, uh, The Money Changer 8, The Luciferian Agenda, An Ancient Plan. Uh, if you haven't, I've got a few copies up here. You can just come up and ask me after, and I will uh, uh, give you a copy of it. And uh, much of that, the idea of what this type of religious uh, system affecting the entire world is spelled out in this uh, newsletter. So Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2 refers to the future 1,000 years government of the Lord Jesus Christ on this earth. And that's coming. That's the promised kingdom to the Jewish people that they have never yet received. Their kingdom will come. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 2 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow into it. Now, Jesus will be in top of and rule over the mountain or big government or nations and hills or small government or countries of the earth. So it's a good idea to understand the meaning of the prophetic words. I will define that in a minute. Many have interpreted the seven mountains as the seven hills of Rome, but this cannot be because it is stated that five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, and it is further stated that they represent kings. Prophetic interpretation rule. Now, this is, if you can keep this in mind as you study scriptures, particularly the prophetic scriptures, mountains or heads, when not named in scripture, means big governments, nations, kingdoms, or empires. Hills means small governments or countries. So if the mountain is not named and it's in prophetic scripture, you can you can bank on it, that's exactly what they're referring to. So, therefore the woman of Revelation 17 verse 9 is pictured sitting on seven big governments or kingdoms. Now, the woman will have significant religious influence over the seventh big government. And there's a depiction there of a German magazine with... Europa riding the beast. Uh, it's, it's, it comes directly out of Revelation chapter, chapter 17, uh, the uh, woman riding the beast. And uh, so I think there's a, a lot in the European Union, which I've uh, presented in, in other classes, um, showing that uh, Europe, the European Union, at its founding, represented the fulfillment of much of uh, of of the of the, uh, of the book of Revelation as far as symbols. Okay, don't have time to go into that now. But seven kingdoms now, seven kingdoms. Revelation seventeen verse ten, and there are seven kings. Five are fallen, and one is and the other is not yet come, and when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So now, get this. 
In the Apostle John's day, five empires had risen and fallen. So five have fallen. In the Apostle John's day, five empires had risen and fallen. They were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. Five in that order. Now, Rome, at the time that uh, Revelation was written, was the empire that is. It was in existence at the time that uh, John the Apostle was penning the book of Revelation. So you have the five that have fallen and the one that is. Now, the Babylonian religious system and her daughters, the mystery religions of Greece, Egypt, and Rome, dominated these six empires. So you have mystery religions that were fornicating, if you will, with the kings of the earth. Mystery religions are those religions that have come out of Babylon. the mother of harlots. So, and they dominated, the mystery religions dominated not only the five that had fallen, but the one that is dominated by mystery religions. Those mystery religions are still going on today, dominating the world. The seventh empire would be future and would last only a short time. And it would come out of these empires or big, powerful governments. Now the seventh head, the other is not yet come, will be the revived Roman Empire. So that was the one that was not yet, the revived Roman Empire. The empires that already risen and fallen in order are, to review, Egypt, Syria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The empire that is, or now existed, in John's time is Rome. And the seventh head, the other is not yet come, is the revived Roman Empire. Now the resurrected system, the seventh head, will not be a restoration of the Roman Empire but of the system that produced the Roman Empire. So it, we're not, not just going to replace it in its place. It's the system that produced the Roman Empire that is in existence and coming into existence today. It will be comprised of a minimum of 10 nations and will not necessarily be contained in the same geographical area as the Roman Empire. Now many, in many cases, many uh, teachers have taught the European Union as the uh, revived Roman Empire because they, they physically located Rome within the confines of the European Union. But as they were counting the countries that became part of the European Union, it suddenly occurred to them it got beyond the 10 that they were looking for. And so there's many more today. So... Uh, we can only conclude that the seven mountains refer to the seven great kingdoms, each ruled by a king. Okay, so uh, what I'm saying here is that the Roman Empire that is being revived is not necessarily confined to the same location. Now today, six of them had fallen because Rome has fallen, but it didn't really completely go away. The seventh head not showing itself will produce the eighth head or the Antichrist. Now, if you, you know, refer back to, to Revelation chapter 17, you'll see some of the wording I'm used here is contained in those. You can see, you can see the progression of this. So the seventh kingdom. Now, Revelation 17 verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seventh and goeth into perdition. Interesting. You know, it sounds confusing, but it's not. 
And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. That was why they believe that the Roman Empire was going to be con uh, consisting of ten nations uh, when it came together. But it's gone far beyond that. Now these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, are people and multitudes and nations and tongues. So that's what waters means in that context, okay? And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So all is not going to be happy in, in this uh, land. And verse 17, For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Notice verse 17. God is putting it into their hearts. So he's using the evil for the good. God uses what he's got. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And... Verse 18, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now, in order to avoid confusion, it should be realized that the beast described in the book of Revelation sometimes refers to the system or empire, and at other times to an individual, the Antichrist. So, in each case, the context of uh, makes it clear as to the identification. For example, when the beast is cast alive into the lake of fire, it refers to the individual because he's alive. And when it is the beast on which the woman rides, it is the empire or empires. So you can see that there's uh, uh, two meanings to, to this. Then depends on the context of the... Uh, of the verses. So now the beast that was and is not probably refers to the fact of Rome's fall and apparent demise, yet Rome never completely disappeared, which I've uh, indicated in previous lessons, but lay embedded within the colonial systems of the nations split from the old Roman Empire. So you have England, the English Empire, Portuguese, the Portuguese Empire, the Dutch Empire, and so on and so forth. And they went all over the earth, and they uh, spread out. And we showed you that octopus last, uh, last week uh, that showed uh, the tentacles of the spread of the empire, of the British Empire, all over the world. And uh, so that Rome never totally disappeared. It just fractioned like the... Like the toes with miry clay. Rome will again, Rome will rise again and the leader of the newly revived system, the Antichrist, will become the eighth and he will eventually be cast into the lake of fire. Now notice in Revelation 17, 17 that this is the will of God to fulfill his prophecy. Now this is the key verse for prophecy in the entire Bible. For God, it says, this verse says, for God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Revelation 17, 17. Key verse for prophecy in the entire Bible. God uses the good, the bad, 
and the ugly to fulfill his will. He sees the beginning from the end. God stands outside of time and sees time in its entirety. So he knows the end from the beginning. The seventh head, the future world government, becomes operational under the eighth head or Antichrist. According to Revelation 17.10, it lasts only a short space, three and a half years of the tribulation. During this time, now the tribulation, of course, is seven years, but the, uh, uh, what we're talking about here lasts three and a half years of that uh, uh, seven-year period. Now, during this time, the Antichrist brings together the governments, armies, commerce, and religions of the ten-nation confederacy. Now, he uses, we haven't yet told you the ten-nation confederacy. We've told you about it in previous lessons, but we'll get to it shortly. He uses the harlot system to advance himself to the center of the world religions. So he uses the harlot system, the mystery religions, the new age, the occultic. At mid-tribulation, the Antichrist produced by this seventh head, the revived Roman system assumes the identity of the eighth head. He attempts to force himself on the world as a self-appointed God existing for only three and a half years before being totally destroyed when Christ returns. The ten horns in Revelation 17, 11 are ten kings who will receive great kingdoms by assisting the beast or antichrist. They rule for a short time, three and a half years. This is the alliance of rulers and armies that the Antichrist leads on the final day of the tribulation, which are destroyed in the battle of Armageddon. We haven't even talked about Gog and Magog in this, uh, these lessons here. Gog and Magog is specifically talked about in, uh, in Ezekiel. Uh, chapters 38 and 39, uh, I believe that uh, Gog and Magog is a war that's going to happen before the rapture of the church, before the seven-year tribulation. At least it's going to start. And I believe it's going to be before that. One of the reasons for that is the burning of the weapons for seven years. And if, they, if the Jews have to flee Israel at mid-tribulation, there's not seven years in which they can, uh, can burn the weapons, is there? Yeah, so you almost have to say Gog and Magog occurs three and a half years before the tribulation begins. So, in Revelation 17, verse 16, hate the whore indicates that the Antichrist must destroy the religious system to make himself God. So in Revelation 17, 16, hate the whore indicates that the Antichrist must destroy the religious system to make himself God. So they're building up the religious system to give him power over the earth. And I see that happening today in this ecumenical, emergent church going towards interfaithism, that there's truth in all religions, and that we all should just get along, right? And the United Religions Initiative that is being promoted in this world today to bring a type of United Nations into the religious system. So it's all going together. It's in your Bible, folks. It's there. You can see it. And it's happening today. That great city is the headquarters of the harlot, the religious system. Now, Daniel chapter 7, verse 8 says, 
I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaketh great things. So there were ten horns. Another little horn comes up, and it becomes the eighth. Remember, we were talking about it becomes the eighth. So this other little horn, and this little horn that's coming up is, is, has a mouth speaking great things. And three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. So ten makes seven, and the one coming up is the eighth. So that answers the question of what does all of that mean in Uh, the scriptures that we have just read. Now going to verse 24, it says, And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. So it's being said in a different way, but it's the same thing. So depending on how you look at it, The little horn is either the eighth, because he uproots three of the ten, or he is the eleventh, because there were ten previously, and now another one comes up. So uh, you see this in various scriptures, and it all refers to the same thing, no matter what the numbers are showing. So the beast of Revelation 17, 11, described from Daniel's perspective, is the same as the 11th horn or little horn of Daniel 7, verses 8 to 27. So the 11th horn of Daniel 7 will rise to power among 10 nations of the revived Roman Empire. The Antichrist will rise out of the 10 kingdoms. He shall subdue three kings. Daniel 7.24 indicates that he will deal with three obstructionist kingdoms by striking them down and removing their kings, after which he will assume control of the ten kingdoms. Now, therefore, there's seven, or ten minus three is seven, plus one, the Antichrist himself uh, assumes control. Uh, He's the eighth. Remember the ten regions proposed by the Club of Rome. We saw in a previous lesson that are in, are for the most part operational today, and there they are in all of their colorful glory. Uh, You will see, eventually, you're going to see happening if the Lord doesn't return soon. uh, This area that's indicated by the blue, that is United States, Canada, and Mexico become something like the European Union. The European Union was begun with free trade agreements. And we certainly got, we hear about free trade agreements today in our country. And the, uh, they are forming a North American Union. That's what's happening. The, uh, and all of these other colorful uh, uh, divisions, which there are 10. There are 10 if you count them. They all represent a union like the European Union. For instance, Africa there is uh, uh, considered the African Union. And you can see that sometimes uh, uh, on your television. They'll, they'll mention so, so-and-so has went to the African Union to give speeches and things like that. And uh, the Middle Eastern Union there is another one. The South American Union, which is called MACOR, I think it's, it's called, but I, th- I think you can just term it the uh, South American Union. Uh, these are all in place today and operating. So you do have 10 regions, which I believe has divided the world into 10 regions, which make up what is left of the Roman Empire because, as we saw last week, the tentacles of that octopus went out all over the world. And uh, those are the colonial systems that Rome split into, okay? 
Important that you understand that. So the tribulation now. Talk about the tribulation a little bit. Daniel, we get back into our study of Daniel to finish off the chapter of Daniel. Uh, Daniel five, uh, 7, verse 25, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of times. The Antichrist will blaspheme God. He'll speak great words against the Most High. He's into blasphemy. The Lord will execute judgment on all that do likewise. So, watch out in these times. But I believe that the rapture of the church will come before the seven-year tribulation. So, uh, um, and as I've stated before, the purpose of the tribulation is for the salvation of of the Jewish nation. So it has nothing to do with the church. The church should not be here during the seven year tribulation. So in Jude chapter one, verse 15, uh, it talks about judgment and to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts and after and after their own lust, and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Do not hold high. A man. It is only God who is worthy to be held in such esteem. Do not follow the world's systems. You have to live in the world's systems. You have to obey the laws lawfully. The lawful laws. But there comes a time when we talked about uh, in these lessons, we talked about civil disobedience. There comes a time when you are asked to do something that is totally against God. There you have to draw the line. You know. Many will speak against God in the last days, but the Antichrist will outdo them all. The word translated against in verse 25 literally, literally means at the side of, meaning that the Antichrist will attempt to elevate himself to the same level as God. We see this characteristics of the Antichrist in the following verses. So he might, he, if the problem with being around during the time of the Antichrist is he is a great deceiver. A great deceiver. Daniel 11, verse uh, 36, we're jumping ahead a little bit in our study of Daniel. We'll come back to these verses, this verse later, but uh, we want to take a look specifically at the character of this uh, Antichrist, uh, this uh, little horn that we have described. Daniel 11, uh, verse 36 says, And the king shall do it according, the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. This is what he'll do. He is a willful king. He exalts himself. He magnifies himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods. He's a blasphemer. Ah. Uh, Unfortunately, I've heard things out of the mouths of some of our leaders that uh, match some of this here. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes 
and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. He will want to be God and he'll want you to think he is. He wants to usurp God. He wants to take God down. And he thinks he's going to win. Otherwise, why would he do it? So he is an insane person. He's an insane, and, and he, his insanity comes directly from Satan himself, who is an insane angel. This is what pride does to men and angels. The Antichrist will receive the worship of many. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. And there was given unto him, the Antichrist, a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And verse 15, and he, the false prophet, had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is awaiting all of those who are left behind at the rapture of the church. That he shall wear out the saints of the Most High refers to the persecutions of the tribulation saints, those who are saved during the tribulation period. And God is going... now. Gentiles will get saved during the tribulation period. There's no doubt about it. These, these verses are indicating this. But the um, purpose of the tribulation is the salvation of the Jewish nation. And it, God is going to plead with Israel to change its ways and look upon the one whom they have pierced and mourn. And beg for him. So many will be saved after the rapture of the church. Those who have been saved during these seven years will suffer such much persecution at the hands of the Antichrist. He will think to change times and laws, and in doing so, he shall repeal the Judeo-Christian system of laws, religion, and institutions. What is going on in our own country today? Changing times and laws, twisting the very words of our Constitution that protect us. Because they say the Constitution is a living document, document, not an absolute. If the Constitution is a living document, you can make it say anything that you want it to say. That's the fallacy of, of accepting it as a living document. It is an absolute document. It should be interpreted absolutely. Otherwise, you can change the laws and make them what you want them to be. So, to, to, he is going to, this, this future Antichrist is going to attempt to change the times and the laws, and it's an attempt to exercise authority in the areas that are, exclus, are the exclusive right of God. Times and laws are instruments used by God to regulate the affairs of man on earth through natural and moral laws. You take away the natural and moral laws, you have the confusion that reigns supreme in this land today. Am I correct? However, this, his persecutions of God's people will have a time limit of time, times, and dividing of times. Time means one year. Times being two years and half a time uh, being six months. So therefore, we have... As we've already seen, this makes the time limit to be three and a half years. Now, it may be that the words think to change the times refers to a new universal worldview or new world order and belief system. I think that's also true. Jumping ahead to chapter 9, we see that there is a prophecy that is referred to as the 70 weeks 
of Daniel in which the weeks correspond to years. Now just how the word translated weeks refers to years will be explained fully when we come to Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 in the course of these lessons. There is one year of this prophecy that has not yet been fulfilled. And that week represents a future seven-year tribulation period during which God completes his plan of redemption culminating in the return of Christ. Now we will discuss this prophecy in great detail when we get to chapter 9, but we will need to describe that week at this point in order to introduce the tribulation saints so as to make the remainder of chapter 7 understandable. So, jumping ahead now to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. He's going to be killed, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease, and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Uh, That verse 27 uh, really sets the stage for the seven-year tribulation. Uh, That's where where you really nail down the time limit. You also... uh, You could also move ahead in in Matthew 24 and verse 15 and look at what Jesus Christ has to say about the abomination of desolation occurring in the midst of the week, just like it says here in uh, 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 Daniel 9 verse 27. So these go hand in hand. When Jesus is speaking, he's referring back to this verse here. So therefore, that, that validates the rest of this prophecy in Daniel 9, verse 24 through 27, because it is so accurate. You can go back and find, and, and, and from the decree uh, to rebuild Jerusalem issued by Cyrus, you can go forward in time and you can, and you can calculate when Jesus Christ should appear in Jerusalem, and he fulfills this to the day. And that's in, we won't get ahead of ourselves now because that's in chapter 9, but it is fulfilled to the day. So the Jews should have known when their Messiah should appear. Jesus condemned Israel because they knew not the time of their visitation, and they should have known it. It was simple. They could have calculated it. In verse 27, we find that special weeks separated from the previous 69 weeks. Now, you you can go ahead and take a look at this now. And uh, that week has been separated by a gap called the church age, beginning when Messiah was cut off. Now, notice that John Walvoord's portrayal of the events of Bible prophecy as follows, and uh, since you can't read it, I don't think you can read that on the screen, but you can read this, but I would say just go home and take a look at it, and uh, what you can see, there's a uh, church, there's a gap, uh, which, uh, which is the church age, and that gap occurs between uh, the 69th week and the 70th week of Daniel, and then you find uh, 
uh, the timeline and the order of events, uh, pre-rapture, pre-tribulation rapture, and, uh, and all of that. It's on here, and you can take a look at that uh, on your own. Now, first there will occur the rapture of the church before the seven-year tribulation begins. At that time, the man of sin is revealed, and that which hinders the Holy Spirit working in the church is removed. If the Holy Spirit is removed, then the church is removed. You get that concept there? That's why the pre-tribulation rapture works so well. And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter uh, as from us, as that the day of the Christ is at hand. They thought the tribulation was upon them. They missed the rapture. This is the Thessalonians, that they missed the rapture and they was in the rapture or they were in the tribulation and they were really concerned. I think that should concern anyone. And so uh, Paul is going to comfort them. And so he says, let no man deceive you by any means for that day... What day is that? Shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. So the, in order for uh, the man of sin to be revealed, uh, the falling away comes first and uh, that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Okay. Um, verse 4, Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped? so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So he's comforting them then. He's, he's telling them, you're not in the tribulation. You haven't seen the tribulation yet. You might think you're in the tribulation because you're being persecuted, but you're not in the tribulation yet. I say that to the church today. You're being persecuted you're not yet in the tribulation. That hasn't happened yet. But it will happen if you stay behind. In verse 6, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And how can the Holy Spirit be taken out of the way unless the church of Jesus Christ is first taken out of the way? Because the Holy Spirit indwells you. That doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is not going to be working, but he's going to be working more in terms of how he worked in the Old Testament times rather than indwelling the believers of the uh, tribulation. And the believers of the tribulation are going to come to belief because of what they see happening. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. So when the Holy Spirit is gone, you're going to see the wickedness. You're going to see the wicked man. You're going to see the Antichrist. With the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, it will be a great time of deception. You do not want to be here during that time. Letteth, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, is an old English word meaning to hinder or hold fast. Next, the Antichrist rises to power and enters into a seven-year covenant with Israel. At the midpoint of the seven years, the Antichrist will break the covenant after which there will be three and a half years of great persecution for the tribulation saints by the hand of the Antichrist. And that was found in that key verse for the tribulation, which I showed you in Daniel 9.27, that there will be in the midst, at the midpoint of the tribulation, in the midpoint of the seven years, the covenant the Antichrist will make with Israel will be broken. Daniel 7, 
26, but the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominion shall serve and obey him. In verse 28, Hitherto is the end of the matter. As for me, Daniel, my Cogitations much troubled me, and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Uh, I don't think I'd want to have the dreams that Daniel was dreaming. <laughs> A lot of... Uh, uh, I've had nightmares. I don't think I need those. <laughs> after, after the three and a half years allotted in Daniel 7.25, Satan's and the Antichrist dominion over the saints will end, and God's judgment on him will be swift with the return of Christ. And finally, the millennial 1,000-year reign of Christ will begin. It should be understood that the revived Roman system will be completely destroyed before the millennial kingdom will begin. No remnant of it will remain. It will disappear from the earth and the righteous rule of Jesus Christ will be for a thousand years and there will be sin happening even then in this righteous rule with Satan bound a thousand years. Can you believe that? You have no excuse. You can't say the devil made me do it. The kingdom under the whole heaven refers to the greatness of the earthly domain. God's kingdom will be given to the saints of the Most High. The kingdom was prepared for them from the beginning. Notice that Jesus says to those on his right hand, the righteous of the judgment of the sheep and the goats after the tribulation. Uh, Matthew 25, verse 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. O oh, blessed day. Even with the prospect of the Messianic age, Daniel was deeply troubled because much would take place before that event. He realized it wasn't a short time that there was going to be many years that would take place. Daniel was hoping for immediate relief. Reynold Showers, in his commentary, concludes his commentary on this section of Daniel with these words. And I think we close with this, yes. And this is Renault Showers. Very good uh, commentary, by the way, uh, if you want to pick it up. Uh, he says, Daniel 2 portrayed Gentile world dominion as it appears to rebellious man. In other words, the, I, other words it, when we looked at Daniel 2, we were looking at man's interpreting what he was seeing in his dream. Therefore, it presented that dominion as a brilliant, glorious human image. Because man has high expectations for himself, right? Daniel 7 portrayed it as it appears to God. Therefore, it presented Gentile dominion's true inward nature, that of wild, voracious beasts. That's what we saw in Daniel. We saw, we saw Daniel chapter 2 portrayed from God's vantage point in Daniel chapter 2. I think that's enough for today. And this is the end of the study of Daniel lesson 9. Let's uh, close in prayer. Father, we bow our hearts before you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy, love, and kindness. We ask you, Lord, to guide our hearts as we go through very uh, difficult times in this world, Lord. And we ask you to help us to keep looking up, that we, we never get discouraged because we know who we are in Christ. We know where we belong, and we do not belong uh, in the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. 
We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. And we ask you to bless those that are here assembled today. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful mercy, kindness, and love. In Jesus' wonderful name we pray, amen. Amen.